I'm Adrian Forsyth. Um, I'm author of uh, Nature of the Rainforest, Costa Rica and Beyond, uh, with Michael and Patricia Fogden as photographers and uh, longtime um, associates of mine in exploring these rainforests. There's a lot of coffee table books out of the rainforest, but a lot of them don't have much information content about the complexity of the interactions that generate all that fantastic uh, beauty and imagery. Most people involved in U.S. agricultural policy and in the U.S. economy don't know that uh, this big stream of moisture comes out of the western Amazon rainforest and eastern Andes right around March, April, when people are starting to plant corn and soybeans, and it's what provides a trillion-dollar water service to U.S. agriculture. It's this tremendous chemical uh, diversity that exists as a result of interactions with uh, the physiologies of birds and monkeys and, and other organisms that uh, plants have to deal with uh, that is, uh, I think, the long-term uh, you know, genetic capital that uh, civilization has to work with. It takes a long time for uh, humans to discover uh, utility in natural systems. So I think, you know, part of what we're talking about in terms of conserving rainforest is the long-term genetic storehouse for humanity to the extent that uh, we let short-term economic strife uh, determine our strategies for depleting those forests or uh, converting those forests other to, to use. You know, that'll ultimately be the end of the potential for civilization as a rich and rewarding experience. There's this amazing richness of chemical and mechanical interactions between predators and prey, whether it's bird and leaf mimicking stick insect or katydid or uh, a parrot in the seed uh, that is, explains a lot of the richness of these forests in terms of what can survive there and all the novel uh, physical and biochemical adaptations they've developed uh, in this cool evolutionary struggle that they're all engaged in. They've evolved this amazing big sharp hook bill. I've actually seen one of these macaws cut a wooden broomstick in half as though it were a stick of butter. This one is eating a terminalia uh, tree, what they call an almond tree in Costa Rica, loved by scarlet macaws. And they're almost 40% tannin by weight. If you would touch that uh, raw uh, terminalia, not to your tongue. It would feel like your tongue was instantly be, being turned into leather by all the phenolic compounds on there that uh, complex and destroy protein structure. But macaws uh, not only can uh, you know crack open and eat these nuts, uh, they can also withstand the chemistry of them. Looks very cute. Uh, it calls out to be stroked like a, a nice Persian cat or something like that. Uh, but if you do, you will be writhing on the ground in intense pain. Uh, it's just defended by spines that have very potent toxins. They uh, break off in your skin. I've had them, you know, on a sort of weakly dependent part of skin, like a forearm, sort of fester for weeks. You know, people go to tropical forests and they worry about being bit by a poisonous snake or, um, you know, eaten by a jaguar. So it's stinging caterpillars and stinging ants are far, far more likely to be your most painful encounters with rainforest. And yeah, this is a pretty common um, bird. Mott moths are found in most uh, tropical American forests, and they, you know, fill a niche uh, that is pretty much indicated by looking at that formidable bill, and they are very strong birds who are capable of flying down and scooping up a giant big dung beetle or a uh, lizard, and they fly back to their perch and they beat the, the lizard or the beetle senseless. You know, one thing we've learned in the last uh, two decades is that um, most patches, be they, um, you know, a patch on private land or a giant uh, national park, are too small to work biologically. Most protected areas are well on their way to becoming islands. There's a lot of opportunity for engineering the human-dominated landscape that surrounds core protected areas in a way that buffers those core protected areas from the fact that they're becoming islands. That's the world that we're moving into is much more intensive management of the landscape and not believing that a national park is a job that's done.